Welcome to today's webinar, Pedaling Through Pandemic, How E-Cycling Can Keep Post-COVID Cities Moving, hosted by the Maryland Department of Planning in association with the Smart Growth Network. My name is Michael Bayer. I'm the Manager of Infrastructure and Development at the Maryland Department of Planning and Project Manager for the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse. The Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse is a project of the Smart Growth Network, supported by the US EPA's Office of Community Revitalization and managed by the Maryland Department of Planning. In addition to hosting webinars, the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse has a website, smartgrowth.org, that provides current information on effective growth, development, and preservation practices. The website provides news and information about events, funding opportunities, awards, and resources to help local decision makers foster healthy, resilient, and economically vibrant communities. The Clearinghouse is also the virtual home of the Smart Growth Network, a nationally recognized coalition of leadership organizations that have formally endorsed the principles of smart growth. This webinar is one in a series of webinars produced by the Maryland Department of Planning on smart growth and planning topics available for viewing at smartgrowth.org. We are recording this webinar and will be posting it on our website under the Webinar Archives tab. We encourage you to visit the website and to subscribe to our e-newsletter for Smart Growth News and to learn about our upcoming webinars. You can also find out about planning initiatives, planning tools, and educational opportunities in Maryland by visiting the Maryland Department of Planning's website at planning.maryland.gov. The views expressed by the speakers in this webinar are those of the speakers and not necessarily of the Maryland Department of Planning or the State of Maryland. Viewers of this live event are eligible to receive one and a half CM credits from the American Planning Association and 1.5 CNUA CEU self-reported credits from the Congress for the New Urbanism. To log your AICP credits, visit the American Planning Association's website at planning.org, log into your account, and search for the name of today's event, which is Peddling Through Pandemic, How E-Cycling Can Keep Post-COVID Cities Moving. You can also search for event number 9202772. I would like to acknowledge our partner today, Island Press, and their partnerships manager, Jen Hawes. Founded in 1984, Island Press's mission is to provide the best ideas and information to those seeking to understand and protect the environment and to create solutions to its complex problems. So to get started today, our speakers are Melissa Bruntlett and Chris Bruntlett. Melissa Bruntlett and Chris Bruntlett are the authors of Building the Cycling City. They are the co-founders of Modacity, a creative agency using words, photography, and film to inspire happier, healthier, and simpler forms of mobility. Together, they work with a variety of organizations, including municipal governments, transportation agencies, nonprofits, and corporate clients to address the evolving needs of cities, large and small, and enable a variety of mobility options as a way to create successful and more livable regions. They have garnered an international audience by sharing the stories of residents benefiting from these changes and celebrating how designing cities for people make them work better for everyone. Melissa and Chris's stories of emerging bike cultures from around the world have been featured in Momentum Magazine, Grist, Spacing Magazine, and the Huffington Post, as well as many local publications in their hometown of Vancouver. Known as at Modacity Life on social media, they continually challenge the autocentric thinking that dominates the mainstream discourse and present a compelling vision of a future where their two children and countless others can grow up enjoying the freedom of unlimited movement in a human scaled city. Following the presentation, Melissa and Chris will answer as many questions as time permits. You can submit a question anytime during their presentation by using the questions tool in the control panel located on the right side of your screen. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Melissa, who will be leading our conversation today. Welcome, Melissa and Chris. Thank you. Uh, just a Sorry, we're just working through one small technical difficulty. Uh, Bit later, let me see. There we go. There we go. Wonderful. Okay. So 
Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you, Michael, for that uh, comprehensive uh, introduction. I uh, just want to start out by thanking the Maryland Department of Transportation Planning, sorry, and uh, an Island Press for hosting this webinar. Um, and uh, where we are located in the world, uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Uh, we're pleased to be with you here from Delft in the Netherlands. So first, a little bit about us. We've, we've already had a very good introduction from uh, Michael, but we'll go on uh, to just talk a bit about our lives now that we've moved to the Netherlands. So we moved here in February of 2019 from Vancouver, Canada, um, following very prosperous careers over there, but given the opportunities to work for some prominent uh, Dutch organizations over here. So I work as the International Communications Specialist for Mobicon, which is a Dutch-based consultancy working mainly in sustainable transportation with the motto of making the world less dependent on the car, uh, with three offices in Delft and uh, two in North America. And so my role uh, through that company is to promote a lot of the ideas that are happening here and elsewhere to an international audience uh, as one of their native English speakers. I benefit from that. Uh, and uh, sharing a lot of the things that we'll be talking about this, this evening or afternoon in terms of changes to street levels and the benefits thereof. And uh, as Melissa's other half, I am uh, the marketing and communication manager for the Dutch Cycling Embassy. It's a public-private partnership here that was started by the national government to export some of this knowledge and expertise that exists here in the Netherlands. Uh, so we work with cities around the world to help implement some of these uh, ideas and, and uh, some of this inspiration that can be found on Dutch cities and, and Dutch streets. Uh, as Melissa mentioned, yes, we, we wrote a book about Dutch cycling in, in 2018 that brought our family here and uh, we now happily live uh, in Delft, just outside of Rotterdam, uh, in the west of the Netherlands with our two children, their age 11 and 13. So before we get into uh, some of the ideas we're going to present around promoting paddling through the pandemic, uh, first, we want to acknowledge that um, while this there is an, an opportunity to be presented in terms of trying to create more space and potentially some lasting change on our streets for walking and cycling, we have to acknowledge that this uh, pandemic is in fact a crisis for a lot of people. Uh, there's been a lot of lives lost, a lot of economic uh, crises in various jurisdictions around the world. And so while there is an opportunity to change uh, some mobility habits, we need to recognize that um, while this uh, current status uh, might prove fruitful going forward in the immediate and for a lot of people, this is still a very hard time for a lot of people. And so we need to be cautious in our language not to celebrate, but rather acknowledge the opportunity, um, but then um, while still recognizing the lives that have been impacted because of COVID-19. So if you've uh, been paying attention to social media these days, you'll see there's a lot happening around cycling and we're gonna kind of break it down into three different waves. The uh, initial uh, movements or measures that were taking place during lockdown, the post lockdown measures, uh, and then looking ahead to a, re a post COVID recovery um, so the first measures that cities implemented around cycling um, were to counter this, this lockdown effect. If your dining room table was anything like ours uh, during the months, months of March to present, uh, it was crammed with laptops and, and, and children trying to do schoolwork. Um, and, and our family in particular was trapped inside uh, for good portions of the day. And we really felt it could impact on our physical health and our mental health. Um, not being able to get outside, access nature, exercise our bodies, see our neighbors. Um, and so cities uh, started out by providing uh, opportunities for people to have that, uh, that exercise, that social contact, um, and that uh, restoration of their mental health uh, in, in places, streets, uh, parks, plazas, uh, where they can get outside and move their bodies in socially distant ways. Um, so we'll talk about a couple of examples of those uh, lockdown measures that took place. So the first, and it's an American example, is in the city of Auckland where they implemented, oh, I keep saying Auckland, I'm so sorry, Oakland. 
Auckland is later, uh, where they implemented slow streets uh, as a measure to try to provide these spaces for people to get respite from being indoors while maintaining a uh, safe physical distance. And so they implemented 75 miles of slow streets. So that's 10% of the city streets throughout Oakland, um, where no through traffic was allowed and that uh, made space for not just cycling, but also for walking. And um, they did this through signage and barricades uh, to indicate that these were spaces not for driving through. Uh, and that was the whole idea behind it again, was to promote distant activity so people could maintain some level of both physical um, movement for their health, but also getting fresh air and also interacting with others, uh, helping to combat a bit of the social anxiety that a lot of us were facing. And this was done through working with partners throughout the city and was measured, modified as needed throughout the process to make sure that the system ran smoothly and benefited everyone. The city of Austin uh, took a slightly more uh, incremental approach to their uh, slow streets program, which I actually framed as healthy streets. Um, and it's been implemented so far in, in two phases with multiple phases perhaps coming in the future. But each phase was basically selected through an online consultation process. People were allowed to uh, recommend corridors. And then once the corridors were proposed, um, people were allowed to comment on ones that they liked and ones that they didn't particularly like. Um, and this was all about, again, creating space for walking, rolling, jogging, um, getting outside, getting fresh air and, and getting exposure to uh, the elements and 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 um, the each of these corridors was uh, overseen by block captains, which were volunteer residents that lived along that street and were making sure that everything was taking place, that signs weren't being t moved or or uh, some of the the measures were being ignored. Um, and largely, it's been considered a, a success. Seventy seven percent of those people that are surveyed online uh, were in favor of these slow streets measures. So looking ahead, uh, we move to the city of London, uh, where coming out of lockdown, they're dealing with, or they're trying to deal with how to manage physical distancing measures at the same time as people returning to work and the economy starting back up. And they immediately noticed the challenge with transit, as many cities are, where by following the two meter physical distancing rules, it uh, cut the capacity of their transit down by, to one fifth. Uh, with 8 million jobs, uh, journeys, sorry, <laughs> during the day, uh, that presents a particular problem for a system that was, at the time, before the pandemic, transit was a lot of the way that Londoners and people outside London would get around, and the inevitable switch that could happen to cars would be disastrous, not just for higher levels of traffic, but obviously for increased pollution and the effects that would have on freight and delivery times throughout the city. And so going forward, the measures that they're hoping to implement and they are starting to implement is looking to increase the miles biked uh, tenfold and increase miles walked by five in order to help um, give people options so they don't have to feel that they have no other option to drive in the city of London. So the, the question that cities are now asking themselves is no longer can we afford uh, to invest in walking and cycling, but can we afford not to? And this was perhaps best quantified um, by a Amsterdam-based uh, research agency called Decisio, um, who conducted this uh, study on behalf of the Italian government, looking at uh, some possible scenarios post-lockdown as to how their cities might look if everybody jumped out of public transport and into cars, uh, if the government inter uh, didn't intervene and, and did nothing, um, or on the more optimistic side, uh, providing out, carving out space for uh, people to move more actively on foot and on bicycle and on e-cycles um, and replacing some of those lost transit trips with um, non-car trips. And uh, as you can imagine, the, the, there's quite a swing in terms of the cost to society with all those extra cars on the streets. The streets would essentially collapse under the weight of those cars and we'd be talking about all these negative externalities affecting the people in that city uh, from congestion to pollution, um, and they quantified that cost to society as 20 billion euros to the entire country every year due to the extra car trips. Inversely, if uh, most of those people were provided more active means to get from A to B, um, we'd be talking about a 20 billion euro savings each and every year due to the extra levels of activity, the reduced congestion, the reduced um, pollution that was would be taking place. So. 
Um, the, the cost of intervening is uh, minuscule in, in comparison to the cost of not intervening. Uh, and these are the kind of numbers that cities are using in calculating whether to um, implement some of these, uh, these pro-cycling, pro-walking measures. And I think it's important to note here as well that when we talk about uh, the reduction in congestion as a possible net gain, uh, again, hearkening back to London in terms of the effects on freight, when we remove some of those cars out of the equation, we allow the economy to keep running at a somewhat normal pace. So it's not just the health and environmental factor, but also the economics when deliveries aren't delayed, economics can still, or the economy can still run at a normal pace. So looking to some of these temporary measures, our first example comes out of Germany in the district of uh, Friedrich Schreins Kreuzberg. Uh, or, sorry, not Modacity, Mobicon had the opportunity to work with the district to document the work that they were doing there and we developed a guide um, basically outlining how it was that they constructed 22 kilometers of pop-up bike lanes throughout the city or this district in particular in a network approach. The idea being that to create these lanes to allow um, essential workers or people that needed to get to work, uh, the space to cycle, and then we would make, they would make it in a way that they could be connected from their home to their work, to the shops in a very cohesive way, which we'll talk a bit more about later. What was quite striking about this network is it was constructed in just 10 days uh, using light, quick and cheap materials. So you see the gentleman spraying on a bike. They had tape that they applied, yellow tape, to delineate between the car lanes and the bike lanes. Um, and again, all in this idea of making a connected network that was indicated through a strategic communications plan, as well as signage. So it was very clear to both motorists and cyclists and pedestrians alike where the space was for them to walk safely and comfortably during physical distancing times. Uh, the nice thing about the guide that was produced is that we were able to translate it in several different languages. So not only is it in German, but also English, Spanish, Portuguese, and French. So it provides a guideline for many different countries in terms of how they can potentially implement some of these ideas and a bit of a, a strategy in doing that. So another city that's uh, accomplished uh, quite a bit uh, in a very short period of time is Bogota in Colombia, uh, which was already doing a great deal uh, pre-COVID, but um, as soon as lockdown hit, um, they were forced to implement a series of measures, including almost 80 kilometers of uh, pop-up bike lanes using very light, quick, cheap, cheap materials. Um, they also extended their Ciclovia, which is uh, almost 130 kilometers of open streets, car-free streets that were usually reserved to Sundays. They've extended those uh, open streets throughout the week now from Monday to Friday. Uh, they also had a, a pretty innovative program that would lend free e-bikes to healthcare workers, uh, and that's resulted in a, a significant growth in the number of cycling trips uh, each and every day to help them get from A to B as safely and as comfortably as possible. Uh, our next example is one that most of you are probably quite familiar with if you're following any of the news outlets. Uh, Paris, France has made some bold uh, promises and uh, bold realizations in terms of creating safe space in a city that is notorious for being quite crowded. Uh, so they've built out 72 kilometers of cycle tracks uh, and also created 10 kilometers or six miles of car-free streets in order to allow more space for the residents of Paris and the neighboring areas to move around. Uh, within their approach, they're also, they've also implemented a 50 euro repair subsidy. And so people that maybe have a rusted out bike in their garage or one they haven't used in a while have the ability to get that repaired. Uh, with a little bit of help from the government, as well as a 400 euro e-bike subsidy, which is especially crucial for people that are moving further distances uh, throughout the city to allow them a mobility option without having to get into a car. They've also limited most of their streets throughout the city down to a 30 kilometer per hour or 20 mile per hour speed limit to help slow traffic down and make a safer environment. And they also have uh, plans to move forward to build 650 kilometers within the region of Paris of cycle lanes, uh, which they hope to have completed by the end of 2021. Uh, Lisbon is another uh, European capital that's uh, made a fair bit of headways uh, in the last few months. Uh, so far, they've built 55 kilometers of pop-up cycleways. Um, with a plan to have 200 built by next year when it becomes the EU green capital 
uh, and ho hopefully hosts the uh, Velo City Global Cycling Conference. Um, in addition to that, uh, they're building almost 8,000 secure bike parking spaces um, and issuing almost 3 million euros in uh, bike, electric bike and cargo bike subsidies. Uh, the latter two of which uh, really depend on on that secure bike parking spaces because people tend not to want to leave quite expensive uh, machines in, in the street. Uh, like Paris, they're implementing a, a lower speed limit. Um, and all in all, this uh, checks a lot of boxes when it comes to uh, getting more people cycling more often. Uh, and next we'll look into the city of Milan. It was one of the hardest hit cities, or the area in general, was one of the hardest hit in, this, in the country uh, due to COVID. And so they're having to be quite aggressive in terms of how do they build out their streets to get the community back out and get the country started up again. And so that includes 35 kilometers of cycle routes throughout the country, an e-bike subsidy, or not the country, sorry, for, throughout the city, an e-bike subsidy for up to 500 euros, uh, as well as a citywide speed limit of 30 kilometers per hour. Uh, what's important about Italy is that they're also, or Milan specifically, is that they're also looking at how to widen sidewalks, recognizing that some areas are not quite wide enough to allow for passing with physical distancing. And so they are doing 4.5 kilometers of widened sidewalks, or when that's not possible, creating pedestrian priority zones where the speed limits are reduced to 10 to 15 kilometers per hour, uh, basically dissuading people from driving through and making it a safer environment, not just for walking, but also cycling. So the European Cyclist Federation, which is the, uh, the body that uh, promotes uh, cycle-friendly policies uh, and is kind of a umbrella organization for the various national organizations here in Europe, has issued a very clean and, and easy four-point pl uh, plan uh, to promote cycling post-lockdown uh, to help cities make the, the, the wise investments that they need to make uh, to avoid that worst-case scenario. And it uh, includes bike infrastructure, reducing traffic speed limits, uh, subsidizing positive change, uh, and also in potentially investing in cycle logistics to remove uh, the number of heavy goods vehicles on the street. Uh, the ECF is also trying to quantify some of these uh, measures that are happening across Europe with this um, COVID tracker. So you can view it at uh, ecf.com slash dashboard uh, and see exactly what is being announced, what is being built uh, across Europe. And it actually ranks the various cities in terms of um, what they are implementing so far. Almost 2,000 kilometers have been announced, 1,000 kilometers have been built, and almost a billion euros allocated for cycling uh, in, on the continent of Europe. And um, as you can tell, um, it's, uh, it's quite impressive when you consider what virtually every city is doing uh, to, to enact this, uh, this change to their streets. So uh, throughout the lockdown, um, throughout the pandemic, we've been asked a lot of questions about what's happening here in the Netherlands. Uh, what measures are they taking to allow for physical distancing? Uh, how are things, what inspiration can come from over here? Uh, and it's hard for us to answer that question because not a lot is happening here, but that's not for lack of interest. But it's actually a fa uh, because of the fact that the entire country already has a lot of these measures in place through the infrastructure that has been built over the last 50 years. So you can see from this map, it's a map that we've used quite often, um, that very white area you can see on the map from Europe here is the entire country of the Netherlands that is connected by of thousands of kilometers of uh, separated cycle facilities, but also traffic calm streets that make it possible for cycling to happen safely at physical distancing. Um, but also for walking uh, safely through spaces on traffic calm streets. So uh, it's really hard for us to say how the Netherlands can provide inspiration other than to say, look through the history. Uh, and that takes us to the next slide where uh, for those that are familiar or maybe for those that aren't, uh, in the early 70s here in the Netherlands, there was a massive push towards uh, less car dominance around 1971, 1972, culminating with the Stop to Kindermord movement and massive cycling protests as streets became less and less safe and the road fatalities spiked uh, because there was just not enough space for all the cars. Um, and so there was already a movement starting towards uh, reducing cars and making more safe space for walking and cycling. 
that um, basically came to a head in 1973 dur after the or during the OPEC oil crisis, where they had car-free Sundays as a way to um, preserve the oil reserves they had in the country uh, and also help save some money given the high sky uh, skyrocketing oil prices in the country at the time. And that created these empty streets, like you can see in the top two photos, where you had families picnicking on freeways, you had empty streets that were suddenly places for gathering, for social connection. Uh, and that basically was the starting point for a 50-year journey of building out this space following the oil, OPEC oil crisis to create a more uh, traffic calmed environment, a place where there was room for cycling, room for walking, and uh, as a result, the traffic fatalities have drastically dropped in, in those decades to follow. So we're going to take a, a few minutes to share with you, uh, I guess, some lessons, some, uh, some ideas that you can uh, take from this 50-year process uh, that the Netherlands has, has undertaken since the oil crisis in 1973. Um, and hopefully implement in, in your town or city, uh, wherever you live. Uh, the first thing we'd, we would stress is uh, don't be afraid to experiment and, and don't be afraid to fail. Uh, in fact, the, the, right after the oil crisis in 1973, uh, there were several Dutch cities that went through some really high profile failures. Um, they tested out demonstration routes. Uh, Tilburg and The Hague were the two most notable in the top left and top right, respectively. Uh, and uh, they just got it wrong and uh, they tried something and uh, the business community pushed back. In the top right you can see them hiring builders to rip out the cycle track uh, in the middle of the, of the night, uh, which was obviously illegal and they were fined accordingly. Um, but in the top left in Tilburg they similarly uh, just, just botched the process uh, and, and didn't build uh, what was required uh, by the community, most notably an actual network. They were building these individual routes in isolation that weren't actually connecting anything. So if anything, we, we just want to stress, uh, uh, hopefully the Netherlands isn't perfect, it's made its mistakes, and, and hopefully you can learn from some of those mistakes. So from those mistakes, there was a national recognition that um, if a cycle network was going to achieve or going to work it had to actually be a network and so we're quite fortunate to be living in one of the first cities to implement one of those networks in 1984 delft created uh, a, a citywide network that wasn't just one but rather three levels uh, where they provided a network at the city level one at the district level and then one at the right in the core of the neighborhood level essentially creating routes that would connect all residents to not only to the center of the city but to other places and amenities throughout the city where they needed to go and networks like the one in Delft helped to inform the design principles that ended up in becoming part of the National Crow Manual which is a design manual used throughout the country and used as inspiration internationally uh, in terms of designing uh, safe infrastructure not just for cycling but also for walking uh, but there's five key principles within that the first of which and again from the network <laughs> becomes very clear is cohesion in that you need to be able to cycle to where you want to go and if your network doesn't get you to where you want to go then there's a problem and that was why those first test samples didn't quite succeed and were learned from and so thinking about the entire grid thinking about the hierarchy of your roads and where people need to go and making sure they can get there in a comprehensive way is really vital um, to the whole process. So we'll just run quickly through the, uh, the remaining four principles so you get a sense of um, how much thought and effort goes into the network planning process here in the Netherlands because it really is critical to their success. Uh, the second principle is directness and uh, this should be go, go without saying but it's uh, perhaps not as obvious to people who don't ride bikes but people who cycle or would ride a bike need the most direct route possible. They don't like taking all kinds of detours and uh, far too often cities make them go several blocks out of their way. Um, the, the general guidance is that the, the cycling distance shouldn't be more than 1.2, uh, a factor of 1.2 more than the distance, the direct distance as the crow flies. Um, so people really need uh, a convenience more than, more than anything. The third requirement is safety. Again, uh, fairly intuitive and obvious, but uh, people do not want to feel like they're risking their lives uh, by 
choosing a particular mode of transport or else they will not choose it. Uh, comfort is a little bit more of a luxury, perhaps, um, a, a level above safety. So it's not enough just to feel safe, uh, but you also have to feel comfortable on your bike, especially if you're going to attract other demographics, the children, the elderly, uh, and likewise uh, out to uh, on their bicycles. The last one is perhaps the most luxurious is attractiveness and it's uh, perhaps uh, very personal and, and very customizable, um, but it, it just is related to the amount of stimulus along that cycle route, whether it's in the natural environment or in the city, uh, and hopefully keeping uh, things, uh, things for people to look at, people to, for them to interact with, uh, and maintain their attention so that they will choose that particular route on any given day. So all that being said, what's really important to remember for the success of a bike plan is that every bike plan needs a car plan. And that is part of the strategy here in the Netherlands. It's not just looking at how do we get people on bikes from A to B, but also how do we work the car network in a, in a way that maintains the five principles of cohesion, safety, attractiveness, directness, and so on and so forth, um, while maintaining some level of connection for cars. Um, but that doesn't always mean for cars that it's the most direct. A lot of times what that does mean is um, essentially devising a way where the cycle route is the most direct, but the cars have to sort of circumnavigate, which was the plan that they put in place, the traffic circulation plan in Koningen, uh, where instead of allowing cars to permeate the city center, they divided it into four quadrants where cars couldn't travel directly from one quadrant to the other without going to the outside ring road. So that made it direct and convenient for people walking and cycling and a little more inconvenient for people in cars to help dissuade people from driving so often and entice them onto bike or foot. And this sort of falls into the road categorization that exists here in the Netherlands. There's a hierarchy of roads of your national through roads, basically your highways or freeways where speed limits are the highest, uh, down to the local distributor or arterial roads places where the speeds are around 50 kilometers an hour. There's physical and visible separation for other modes, whether that's walking or cycling, and then getting down into the access streets. So these are your neighborhood streets where people live and play, where speed limits don't exceed 30 kilometers an hour, and you see a little more mixing because traffic is moving slowly, but overall that creates a complete cohesive network where people can get where they need to go uh, conveniently with and safely. So speaking of those local access streets, um, one uh, thing we would stress is that uh, it's not enough just to put up a 30 kilometer hour, 20 mile per hour speed limit and then hope for the best. As uh, uh, one of our colleagues, Leonard Nav, likes to say, enforcement is futile. Largely drivers will uh, travel the speed that they feel comfortable speed, uh, traveling. Uh, and if that street tells them to drive faster, they will. Uh, so there's all kinds of uh, these tricks that Dutch engineers use on residential streets to uh, slow the cars down and, and trick drivers into forcibly slowing down. So it's a choice of materials, often brick or uh, paving stone. Uh, there are speed tables or speed humps throughout uh, the uh, okay um, the the length of the street. Uh, there are tie canes and bump outs to uh, break up slight, sight lines throughout the street. So it's not necessarily a direct line. Um, and all in all, it's, uh, it's perhaps something we should be aiming for towards as we look at making some of these slow streets in, in various cities more permanent. So one of the trends we've seen here in the Netherlands and in various places throughout Europe is an increase in e-bike usage. Uh, e-bikes are actually, or see the highest sales here in the Netherlands per capita than any other European or any other country. Uh, and in part, that's due to the mobility options it provides to our elderly. So we see a lot of people uh, in their later years riding on e-bikes because it provides them that extra boost to still be able to maintain their mobility into old age, um, but not have to give up uh, cycling uh, and the comfort and um, ease and access of doing that. But we also see e-bikes as a trend um, in going longer distances. And this is where we see the applicable the applicability uh, in North America and other more sprawled countries um, because it helps to shorten that distance. So for the same amount of effort it would take you to cycle on a regular pedal bike without a motor for five kilometers, you can double or triple that distance with an e-bike without really increasing your effort, 
increasing the amount of sweat that you produce or increasing the energy that you have to use to get there. So this is perfect um, for people that are commuting longer distances as we start implementing a lot of these uh, pandemic solutions on a more permanent basis. People that live in the suburbs have an option to get into the city for their jobs or what have you. Uh, it for more uh, hot places of the world, this provides an option with a reduced stress so or sweat option, which is a which is a factor that we hear a lot about uh, when we're traveling around the world. Is what about workplaces where it gets really hot? You know, 90 to 100 degrees. How do I cycle in that? E-bikes provide a little bit of a solution for that, uh, while still being a little bit greener in your choice and being active. Um, and also, the, one of the biggest pushbacks we get here in the Netherlands is, well, it's flat there, and that's why people cycle. And e-bikes become the non-starter for that conversation. They flatten hills for anyone using them and really provide that extra little bit of mobility, um, regardless of your activity level or energy level. So one last uh, takeaway from the Netherlands we want to leave you with is um, it's synergy between bicycles and public transport that exists here. Um, eventually public transport will be coming back online and will be increasing capacity. And uh, I don't think it's unfair to say that it will need all the help it can get. Uh, and here the public transport agencies see cycling as an ally rather than a competitor um, and use it to increase the catchment areas of their stations and stops. Um, through an investment in secure bike parking, the infrastructure that obviously leads to these places, um, and then a last mile solution that's provided on the other end because uh, they don't want people taking their bikes on the buses or trams or trains uh, due to scalability issues, capacity issues, reliability issues. Um, so they prefer people leave their bike um, at their destination station and then uh, with the OV feats in the bottom left corner, the blue and yellow bikes, at uh, virtually any station in the Netherlands, you can tap the same smart card that you use to ride the transport system um, and borrow a bike for three euros and 85 cents. And um, it's through that cohesive system that you have a bike, train, bike, door-to-door, uh, -door, uh, seamless mobility option that is uh, com competes with the, the convenience of the car. So one of the uh, important things to keep in mind as we start to hopefully make a lot of these um, temporary measures more permanent and we start to help to support local economy and local businesses is the idea of providing an experience. Uh, we, you know, a street is only as comfortable as the environment that exists around you. And when we talk about providing seating, providing places for people to stay, adding greenery and calming those streets, it really creates a very welcoming environment. Um, with us all having been at home for so long, a lot of us has become quite dependent on online purchasing and deliveries. So, you know, safe delivery straight to your door helps to limit the number of interactions you have and also keeping you healthy and safe. But as we move forward, we still want to be supporting local business and we want to make sure that the economy has an opportunity to bounce back. And by creating attractive places where people can come, maintain physical distance, but still have an a enjoyable experience, we can hopefully help support our local businesses as we go forward and really jumpstart the economy. So as we, we start looking forward towards uh, that recovery process, um, I think there is a, a rather robust discussion happening right now in a lot of cities about what that kind of stimulus looks like. How do we invest uh, in our city in terms of creating the maximum amount of jobs, getting the biggest bang for our buck, um, and uh, investing in infrastructure that, that provides the maximum amount of return? And uh, most of you might be familiar with this graphic, but uh, it's rather a, a, a clear illustration that by investing in walking and cycling, we are not only providing a return on investment in terms of congestion reduction and uh, healthcare savings and, and all of those wonderful things, we're also creating the maximum amount of jobs. And if we're talking, looking ahead to a, a new deal, a green new deal, uh, that's going to stimulate uh, funds and, and reinvest in our cities um, with a ongoing and, and looming cri crisis, climate crisis uh, ahead of us, then uh, in these investments in active travel make the most sense. So looking forward, um, the city of Sydney, Australia is one of those cities that's thinking ahead and thinking about how they can plan for the future. So uh, the council has passed a 2056 bicycle network plan. 
Um, recognizing that nearly 2 million of the daily car trips made in the city are under two kilometers, so easily bikeable and arguably also walkable. Uh, they've also understood that of their population, 70% want to cycle more, but only 1% do. And so there's a huge untapped market there in terms of getting more people on bikes. The route or net network itself has 5,000 kilometers planned in routes. Uh, and it is a 36 year plan, so that is quite a distance from now. I can't even think about how old I'll be then. Um, but uh, local coalitions of business leaders throughout the region are pushing to reduce that to three, in part to help uh, provide safe options for people with physical distancing needs, but also provide those options to boost the local economy. And so there's a uh, huge potential to be seen in Sydney, and we're excited to see what happens. Just to prove that uh, that these kinds of measures aren't just happening in uh, quote unquote developed uh, countries, uh, it's important to uh, point out that they're also happening in Uganda. So this is a uh, a member of the Dutch cycling embassy, Hoodapple, that are doing some consulting work in Kampala, where the uh, the city council there passed a non-motorized transport plan in 2018. Uh, but as soon as the 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 lockdown hit in March, uh, the president of Uganda accelerated that plan. Um, and started implementing a number of car-free streets and cycle track pilot projects as a kind of test study. Uh, this is still a city that uh, over 50% of the population uh, walks or cycles, uh, but it's still really car dominated. And so they're hoping to rebalance that uh, allocation of space and, and provide people with uh, more safety and more dignity as they travel from A to B. And finally, I did mention Auckland at the beginning. This is where the slide is. <laughs> um, we've had the fortune of traveling to Auckland, New Zealand twice and um, really love the city. And it's very encouraging, exciting to see um, a lot of plans that have been made in the last five years or so starting to come to fruition, but also some aggressive plans moving forward, including council passing an access for everyone policy that will encourage uh, new walking and cycling trips. So based on some of the Dutch models that we spoke about earlier, they've developed a traffic circulation plan that looks to provide that safe space, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, they've also got a new street design manual that looks at the prioritization of space uh, for each of the modes to create a safer route. Uh, and this is all in support of not just the local government policies, but also the national government um, with the Green Party there being quite proactive in terms of pushing for um, options that move us toward, move the country towards sustainability. Uh, they're also providing 90% of the funding for these pop-up walking and cycling measures throughout the country. And so that's leading to um, some very positive steps forward for a city that was already doing a lot for shared space, but can now also do a lot for cycling. And it's uh, really important to mention that all of these measures are really great, but only great if you're thinking about everyone that you're trying to reach. So we know the conversation in the US right now is very focused on how to make cities more equitable. And one of the first ways to do that from a transportation planning perspective is to make sure that you are planning a network that is accessible to everybody and thus making it more equitable. So when you're planning a network, how do you plan it to make sure that children can move safely, whether that's from home to school or everywhere in between as they do here, whether you're allowing elderly to keep their mobility well into old age and are you facilitating that with the networks you're planning? Uh, we hear a lot of conversation around disability and how moving, removing space for cars negatively impacts them. But what we visit, what we see here is that these implementations actually benefit a lot of those people living with physical disabilities because they can use the cycling infrastructure, they can use the calm streets as a means to get around safely and comfortably. And we've actually met a number of people here that say that the reason they enjoy living here and the reason that they feel safe is that they have this dignity of space to maintain their mobility. Um, and then taking the equity conversation further when we're looking at race and including everybody in the conversation, when we're looking at a network, I can't stress enough that that network needs to reach all of your communities. It, we talk so much about, or hear so much about gentrification as a result of bike lanes, but a lot of times that's due to the fact that your network that you're planning is not reaching everybody. And so yes, of course, there's going to be attractiveness where you're building these sustainability options. So if you're looking at it from a network citywide approach and you're providing those options for everyone, 
you start to limit the racial inequities that occur when you're segregating those neighborhood the network to certain neighborhoods. Um, and then finally, if we can make one last plea is to bring everyone to the table. It's really hard to design for people if you don't know what they want or where they want it. Uh, we talk a lot about if you really want to understand how to get these groups on bikes, how to get women, how to get kids, how to get people of color on bikes, and to be using these sustainable options more, you need to talk to them and find out what it is they actually want. So we'll uh, wrap up today with a, a few words on resiliency because we're actually uh, right now in the process of writing uh, a second book uh, with a, an entire chapter on the topic of resiliency. Uh, and we've learned a lot through that process, especially doing it during a global pandemic. Um, but the thing that we've really grown in appreciation for is that uh, the traditional uh, definition of resiliency, the engineering definition of resiliency is uh, kind of the amount of stress or, or change a system can absorb before it uh, bounces back to normal. Uh, and there's actually an alternate definition of resiliency that we should perhaps be considering an ecological form of resiliency, which is not necessarily bouncing back to the same state, um, but absorbing sh uh, shock, absorbing stress, uh, and potentially crossing a threshold to an ultimate uh, regime, a, a more stable regime. Uh, and we would argue that's exactly what happened in the Netherlands in the 1970s, uh, staring the face of, of car dominance in their cities, uh, the, the oil crisis and the, the road safety crisis there, kind of forced their hand uh, to head in a different direction and find a new uh, new normal, if you will, uh, post-crisis. And, and these two images are, are taken 50 years apart, but perhaps couldn't be more striking in terms of uh, a family in Amsterdam stenciling some bikes on the street uh, and a, a construction worker in Milan doing the same in, in 2020. So hopefully uh, we can use this uh, crisis not to return to normal, but to find ourselves a new normal. So that wraps up the presentation portion of our webinar. Um, as was mentioned at the beginning, we can be found on social media at Modacity Life. Uh, if you want to tweet at us or, or follow us, whatever you wish to do. Uh, we can also be reached for questions that we don't get a chance to answer at each of our emails that you can see on the screen. Uh, also, as was mentioned at the top, we have written a book uh, called Building the Cycling City, the Dutch Blueprint for Urban Vitality that contains a lot of the lessons, a few of the lessons we presented here and a lot more lessons on what the Dutch did to create the networks that they have here, um, but also some inspiration from elsewhere in the world, a lot, of North, or, yeah, a lot of North American cities that are implementing these ideas or have implemented them already to some success. Uh, if you're interested in learning more, you can purchase the book at islandpress.org. And if you use the promo code webinar, you can get 30% off the book. Um, and then we do have another one coming in spring of 2020, 2021. So keep an eye out for that. Um, do you want to reveal the title? I don't think no. we said this out loud. No, we won't no. reveal the okay. title yet. <laughs> um, thank you again to uh, our hosts for having us. Um, it's been a treat to be able to put all these ideas together for everyone. And we look forward to hopefully being able to answer some of your questions. And we always leave everyone with a quote at the end of our presentations that the best time to build a cycle track is 20 years ago, but the second best time is now. Thanks, everyone. Great, thank you, uh, Melissa and Chris. And thanks to everybody who has submitted a question already. We've gotten quite a few, and you can continue to uh, submit them through the questions tab. And we'll ask um, that uh, Melissa and Chris turn their webcam on so you can see them while we go into the questions and answers. Um, so we actually got several comments um, relative to the um, lack of bike helmets in the Netherlands and in some of your examples. Um, can you speak to that, kind of what's what's required and kind of what culturally um, is is the norm? Uh, That's our favorite yeah. topic. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there is no helmet legislation throughout the country of the Netherlands. Um, we did come from a, a jurisdiction that had helmet legislation in British Columbia, Canada, one of three, two, two or three provinces that had mandation. Um, I mean, it's not, we have a very strong opinion about helmet, mandating helmet use. Um, we don't shame anyone for wearing them. We just don't think they should be 
mandated by law because we have seen some detrimental impacts of doing that. The most notable would be in Australia. And if you talk to any cycling advocate in Australia, they'll probably tell you how numbers dropped very dramatically with the introduction of a law there. Um, yeah, it'd be basically here, the reason that cycle, cycle helmets are not needed is because the infrastructure is comfortable and safe. And so the conflicts that people experience uh, are so, so reduced because people have been given the safe space to travel, but also the networks and the, um, that we talked about earlier, that idea that neighborhood streets are rarely more than 30 kilometers an hour significantly reduces the um, potential for serious injury. Um, there's a graph that you can find anywhere on the internet that shows that as speed increases, so does the um, injury and fatality rate for vulnerable road users. And so by creating this safe network, they have basically created an environment where people don't feel they need to be protected whenever they get out. Um, we do see them from time to time. Uh, they're usually tourists, to be honest, um, but uh, yeah, that's what else can we say about that that hasn't already been said before? Um, yeah, no, I think you've said. Okay, uh, yeah, that's about <laughs> that's about all we have. <laughs> understand? Okay, thank you. Um, so we appreciate kind of the international uh, theme today. So I'll start with a couple actual questions from uh, possibly your former colleagues in Canada, uh, including Michael Black from Toronto, who has a comment and a question. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic may still be with us through the winter. We have witnessed a frenzy of bike lane and cycle track building across the continent, and these can be used by cyclists, even cities that receive appreciable snowfall, providing that adequate plowing and salting is undertaken. What is the best strategy to convince municipalities that are really hurting for money to fund, or, to fund winter maintenance of cycling facilities at a level of service that is higher than in previous years? <laughs> yeah, we we would have two answers for that question. Um, I think you start out with the the economic one and and come back to this um, this study of, of the cost of doing nothing and allowing everyone to jump in their cars. And and we have to understand that transportation is competitive. And so if if the the cycle tracks aren't maintained, plowed, salted, uh, that person is just going to take the car or they're going to take the bus. Uh, and what are the costs to society? Uh, as a result of that additional motorized trip versus the savings to society that would have taken place had they chosen uh, the bicycle. It's difficult to quantify, but it has been done. And, and uh, there, uh, Decisio is uh, one of the leaders in terms of uh, making that economic case. Um, but the other point we would make is just one of equity. And um, if you are not uh, providing space for uh, or maintaining the space for people to walk and cycle, uh, then you're not looking out for the most vulnerable of your residents. And uh, um, it's it's it's. Um, do you want to say a few things? Yeah. About well, yeah. it comes back to this idea that I think a lot of us um, of driving age tend to forget because we are the ones that are often working on these networks. Is not everybody can drive. Not everyone wants to drive. Not everyone is able to drive. And so if cities are not willing to prioritize the trips for those people, then they are being inequitable in their choices. Um, the cost of plowing is something that is incurred in countless Scandinavian cities. Um, we've, we're seeing lots of aggressive policies around creating car-free car centers in uh, Finland and Norway um, and Sweden. And so... Uh, and, and they're not um, unfamiliar with a lot of snow. So there are options out there and to um, essentially say it's too expensive to clear is uh, a kind of a non-starter, but also just forgetting large swaths of your population. I mean, it's the same argument that's made with just the construction of the infrastructure itself. It's like, oh, well, nobody's using it, so we shouldn't plow it. Well, nobody's uh, using it because you don't plow it and, and we don't justify uh, building a bridge by the number of people swimming across the river. Um, so they, 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 it's up to the government really to take the lead on that and trust that people will use the facility. More people will use the facility if it's properly maintained. And uh, it's, it's not an easy argument, but uh, it's, it's one that we have to make. Okay, thank you. This is kind of a related question from Yuri Pelich, who's also in Ontario. Uh, which is how to how best to implement cycling infrastructure and foster cycling culture in Canadian winter cities post-pandemic. 
Um, well, I think uh, Canadians, you have lots of places that have high cycling numbers. Um, or, or ice hockey playing numbers on the pond. I mean, yeah. we're a, a nation that plays ice hockey in minus 40 degrees Celsius. Um, so to say that we're not tough enough to get on our bikes is um, yeah. a bit of a contradiction. But anyways, I digress. Yeah. <laughs> I think um, as long as the uh, infrastructure is not necessarily the infrastructure, but the traffic calm streets, the, the network is there or starting to be there. Uh, we see it in Montreal, they're starting to prioritize uh, plowing of a lot more of their cycling infrastructure and we're seeing ma maintaining of numbers throughout the winter. And um, I think most Canadians know that Montreal gets quite cold. I think one year it was colder than Siberia. So you know, just as you would bundle up to go out for a walk, you would bundle up to go for a bike ride. And so long as that infrastructure is there to use, people will continue to use it. I mean, we built one of our last um, experiences in Canada before we moved to the Netherlands was at the Winter Cycling Congress in Calgary. Uh, and uh, at the time it was minus 25 degrees Celsius. I feel like it was uh, more than that. <laughs> I don't know what the, the Fahrenheit equivalent was, but you could feel it in your nose and your lungs. And uh, Calgary, a couple of years earlier, had invested in a, a comprehensive downtown network of cycle tracks. Uh, and we were out there walking around and people were using it. It was quite impressive to see the numbers. Um, they were wearing ski goggles. They were wearing wool hats. They were wearing snow suits, snowmobile suits, um, <laughs> and, and riding winter bikes. And they had a separate bike for the summer. Um, but they, they adapted and they adjusted. It's, it's a matter of providing the space and the people will use it. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, I think well, the only other thought I would leave with leave that with is that um, it's really important. We get oftentimes in the cycling advocacy world get stuck in the idea of how do we maintain cycle trips, um, and it's really not about just one mode. It's about a whole suite of modes. So you might not have them cycling through the winter, but they might choose to walk instead if it's close enough, or use a combination of walking, public transport, or biking, public transport. Um, so again, just yeah, remembering that we're we're Canadians and we're hardy and we can manage, even though we did live in the more temperate climate the last 10 years. Um, so yeah, try not to fall into the trap of uh, basically only looking at one mode, but thinking that cold is going to keep people away because if you provide the space, people will use it. Okay, thank you. We also got a question, I guess, on the opposite end of the spectrum. Uh, what do you say to people who need to go to meetings in business attire after sweating on a bike? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's not for everybody. Uh, but I, I think far too often these weather conditions are used as excuses not to change the streetscape without actually asking people whether they would use it. Um, and as Melissa said, sometimes it's an e-bike. Uh, we've certainly seen in, in uh, no, yeah, this summer, it's been quite mild, but um, last summer it reached 45 degrees Celsius here in the Netherlands for the first time in recorded history and people were out on their bikes uh, in whatever they were wearing. Um, so it's, uh, I think when we look at the barriers to cycling, uh, the, the safety and the comfort is at the top of the list and some of those geographic conditions may be uh, overstated at least, if not irrelevant. Okay. We'll kind of move on from that area to other topics. Um, some devices called e-bikes are really e-motorcycles. On my local bike path, there is no enforcement of these fast, heavy vehicles. If cities want to attract cyclists of all ages and abilities, how can we keep these vehicles from scaring away kids and other cyclists we want on these lanes and paths? Uh, that is an excellent question. Um, the first answer to the question would be um, to create again, that network. So um, when we're talking about recreational paths, I can definitely see the issue there with speeding bikes, passing small children. Um, but if you've created a calmed network where kids can cycle to friends' houses, to schools, community centers, swimming pools, and everything underneath that umbrella, uh, then um, you've created a more traffic calmed environment. Um, here in the Netherlands, there are certain bikes that aren't allowed on certain pathways and so there is a bit of policy that's required um, so one of the things that um, I've been helping support uh, with Mobicon here we um, well prior to my joining the company they created a policy referred to as uh, or traffic in the city um, with the local Dutch touring company which or organization which is the 
basically the AAA equivalent over here, but covering all transportation modes. And through that, they've identified essentially vehicle families that can exist in certain spaces that are determined by their mass and their speed. And so there are certain areas where, depending on how those families don't match up, so walking or slow cycling with these higher speed bikes, then we need to look at separation or we need to put in slower, uh, slower speed limits. Uh, so that comes into the traffic calming that Chris talked about in terms of developing the space to dictate the behavior um, and separating when it's just not possible. So um, yeah, it's really important to look at it from but that perspective. Is, so you didn't really go into it, but the faster category of electric bike that's capable of going faster than 30 kilometers an hour, uh, you need a license plate, you need uh, registration, insurance, a helmet, uh, requirements and you are not allowed to use uh, most of the cycling infrastructure so you have to share the street with cars it is like a, a motorcycle um, so there is a, a certain amount of reg regulation here that's done and uh, any vehicle that's capable of going faster than 30 kilometers an hour is not allowed on the cycling infrastructure yeah the other thing i think that's important to note is the width of a lot of the infrastructure here too that that allows for more space for passing for let's say your um, uh, pedal assist e-bike that will go faster than the average child. Let's, like, children are slow, our kids are slow, we get it, <laughs> believe us. Um, but it allows more space for safe passing and more comfort um, so that, um, you know, that the two meter minimum that exists in a lot of cities really creates that stressful environment. And here the minimum is 2.2 to two and a half meters, which creates a lot more space for um, safe distance passing for those faster moving bikes to not create too much stress for the other people they're sharing the route with. Okay. Um, related question on uh, e-bikes is, what do you think about the effectiveness of e-bike share? Um, I mean, if <laughs> I think it has a lot of benefits. We, we visited the city of Bern in Switzerland back in the fall uh, of last year, and they have a bike share system with, and I think it's similar to like New York and Montreal where some bikes are e-bikes and some are not. Uh, Bern is quite a hilly city. It's located right in the bed of the mountains. Um, and so this provided a big option for people to have a bike to get to where they need to go. Um, a little more comfortably. We used them, all four of us used them and found them, they made the trips a lot easier. Uh, so in that respect, it helps to save people the cost of an e-bike but still have the option. Um, the trick is making it affordable, I think is the biggest challenge for a lot of cities. Yeah, and also if it's a dockless system, uh, providing adequate places for people to park it uh, so that they're not cluttering up the footpaths because I think that's the immediate criticism they get because um governments are, are unable or unwilling to designate parking spaces on the streets and remove car parking uh they ultimately end up cluttering up the footpath uh and making people angry so there has to be some thought given to to that as well but uh yeah more more e-bikes for everybody we're, we're certainly <laughs> <laughs> not against that idea okay thank you uh, next question is, for cities that are more car-centric, what's your best advice or suggestions to get city leaders to see the value of investing in open streets and pop-up bike infrastructure? Yeah, you just got to try it. I mean, uh, Calgary was the example that I cited. Um, it's a really amazing example of what's possible um, with relatively low risk, so showing uh the city council was convinced to try it for a few months uh and and if it didn't work if people didn't use it uh if it backed up traffic too badly then they agreed to remove it and and they measured it quite closely and adjusted it and uh lo and behold it it uh it attracted all kinds of people and and, and didn't affect traffic so i think far too often we we sit around and we try to argue about renderings and drawings and, and diagrams and uh and you just sometimes need to try it and um if, if this corona situation has, has told us anything or provided anything it's a low risk environment to try things uh with relatively little disruption to traffic because there's not as many cars on the street um so point two yeah point two every single city we showed 
point to Calgary, point to, I mean, if Calgary can do it in the middle of the Canadian prairies, uh, it's a sprawling car dominated, uh, wintry city. Uh, I think virtually anybody can do it too. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, next question, a little different, is uh, bike parking a problem? Not just the massive parking lots, but the many bikes scattered along streets, cl clustered near doors, landscaping pots, et cetera. Are these problematic? And do you have any solutions? Uh, it's, it's certainly, I mean, if you've seen any pictures of Dutch streets, um, it's no question that uh, bike parking, because of the sheer number of people that bike, um, it's basically 1.2 bikes for every resident of the country here. They There's just not enough space to park them all, and so they do end up all over. Um, but that's not to say that this, each city isn't coming up with solutions to try to solve that, uh, whether that's increasing capacity at stations, uh, creating new facilities in city centers where people are coming and spending time. They're um, actually designating parking assistants that are in the city center, yeah. making sure people bike their, uh, park their bike in the designated area. So they're allocating resources. Yeah. And then you're also seeing um, temporary measures coming in through various industrious organizations. So um, uh, the Dutch Cycling Embassy, one of your members, mm, did pop up. Yeah, a pop up basically bike corrals. Um, but these, these are very Dutch problems. I think that's really important to note that, yeah, there's bikes everywhere, but it's a very Dutch problem. Uh, the counter problem that we've experienced in a number of North American cities and other cities uh, in Europe is a lack of bike parking. Uh, and so really integral to your bike strategy needs to be where are those bikes going to go. So if you're worried about them being in the middle of the sidewalk up against buildings strewn everywhere, that's probably going to happen if you don't provide them with a, a place to park. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a full fledged facility, um, although that would help to encourage people who have more expensive bikes to have a safe place to park their bike and feel comfortable and more likely to ride more often but also street parking, uh, more than just one, um, what do they call it, staple rack uh, on a, on, in front of a shop. And that holds two bikes, maybe three if there's someone's traveling together. You need to be thinking bigger. If you're trying to induce more trips into the city, they're gonna want a place to park their bike. And they may not make that trip at all if they don't have that safe place to park their bike. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, and this is related to the examples that you're walking through during the presentation uh, were traffic signal timing changes made in these cities to accommodate the new amount of cyclists it's amazing how quickly deployment of bike lanes was in many of these cities I, i'm not sure about these individual cases but i can say the one thing that has changed here in the netherlands has been um, the timing of the traffic signals so because there are so many people walking and cycling here um, there was a concern that they would bunch up at corners um, and uh, there just wasn't enough space for everybody to maintain that uh, meter and a half um, without it backing up in a, a significant queue or, or lineup or bunching up. Uh, so they've actually given uh, priority and, and more crossing time to uh, cyclists and pedestrians. They've also removed a lot of the beg buttons uh, that people have to press to ask for permission to cross the street. Um, and this is all. Uh, in order to streamline the, the uh, foot and bicycle traffic at intersections um, and to avoid people from bunching up because people in their cars are naturally socially distanced. They're not exposed to uh, other carriers of the virus potentially, but when you're standing at a uh, at an intersection on a, uh, just on a bike or, or not on a bike, um, you are potentially exposed. And so the least they can do is uh, adjust the traffic lights to, to give those people additional time to get across the street and, and not bunch up together. Great, thank you. Um, so the, do the bike plans that you mentioned typically consider or allow e-scooters, rollerblades, or skateboards? Um, so in the Netherlands, um, that uh, document I referred to earlier that had the bicycle families does take into account different mobility options and how they can all travel together uh, safely. Um, however, e-scooters are still not allowed on Dutch streets um, as of right now, so we don't see them very often. I can say that in the city of Vancouver, uh, they did change the policy for a lot of their bike lanes uh, probably four years ago now 
to pilot trying out sharing the space with rollerblading and cycling. Most of the recreational trails already allow for that. Um, so I think it's, I mean, if there's a concern around the sharing of space, I think again, it just comes down to an idea of creating enough space. So making sure that your facilities are wide enough to allow for social distancing, um, which I think, yeah, it's been. Yeah, we, I mean, we see lots of, skateboards and wheelchairs and, and all kinds of wheel devices on the um, on the cycle tracks here. And actually the National Cycling Network also doubles as a natural rollerblading network. So you'll see signs, yeah. um, not just for the cycle routes, but for the rollerblade routes, which is quite fun. Uh, and it just shows that this infrastructure is entirely adaptable and can be used by a wide variety of users. Okay, another infrastructure question. Uh, when mixed flow travel lanes include cyclists and cars, is it safer for cars to drive on the left or on the right? <laughs> well, I would argue that in a mixed <laughs> environment, there should only be two travel lanes of traffic in each, or one in each direction. So they should travel in the same and then accommodate their speed accordingly, I think. <laughs> um, I can't think of any four lane roads that are shared use as well, unless you're thinking of a bike lane. No, that's. Lane. I mean, that's exactly it. It's. Yeah. If it was a four-lane road, it would have to be a distributor road, which requires separation. Uh, so it's only the local access roads that are where it's permitted to be mixed traffic, and then those are by definition just a single lane. Um, yeah, where if you think of your average neighborhood uh, street in the suburbs, um, although they are quite wide in the in North America. Um, basically, if you've got a, what happens here is if you're cycling along and a car comes behind you, they just slowly move around you and carry on because there's no center line that delineates which side you're to be on. But uh, yeah, I think we would both say that anything more than just two lanes of travel is not a place where you should have mixed travel. <laughs> okay. Uh, one of the common fears is about having your bike stolen at the destination. Is this a false fear or is there any data about this phenomenon and what steps can be taken to reassure people about it? No, I think it's a it's a very real fear. We ourselves were subject to bike theft on half a dozen occasions in Vancouver, and have once already here in the Netherlands, uh, right after we arrived. Um, there's no doubt that it's uh, for for property thefts, uh, thieves. Um, the bicycle is the low hanging fruit because they know the police won't uh, um, prosecute or pursue them, and uh, um, they can resell it very quickly and easily. And uh, we're even seeing now with with more expensive bikes and the e-bikes and the cargo bikes out there um, them being targeted by organized crime and and, and their actual trucks that come in and, and take the the bikes away to eastern europe for resale um what can be done i mean there's uh the 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 city i think and the the local chambers of commerce and the business associations have to partner up and provide secure parking so uh in some instances here in city centers like in the hague They've taken old shop fronts and uh, retrofit them to provide a, a, a few dozen secure bike parking spaces. That and, are patrolled, that's important to say. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, that gives customers a, a place to leave their bike. I think this is a very important topic and, 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 and one that we don't talk about far too often. We talk about building the infrastructure in the bike lanes, but we don't talk about these end of trip facilities. and. Uh, we are we are bringing it up where we can uh, to make sure, especially as we say, these these bikes are getting more and more expensive, and people aren't going to leave a a thousand dollar investment uh, just uh, locked to a tree or or whatever a fence or whatever it happens to be. Uh, we've got to do much much better uh, with our city planning. I think the opportunity there lies, at least from what we know through the various cycling advocacy groups that we've met over the years, is oftentimes they have the tools to help businesses at least figure out how they can provide those end of trip facilities. Uh, so providing that safe storage for bikes. Uh, so if it's already safe at your home, you can bike to work and leave it somewhere safe. Um, I think from a school perspective or more public spaces, there again, there needs to be that conversation with local business and the city in terms of providing those spaces but yeah it's it's certainly an issue in almost every city well i would i would argue any city where bikes are out on the streets and it's certainly worth um finding some ideal solutions for okay thank you 
Uh, many of the examples today are in cities. Do you have ideas for states with large rural areas, such as Montana? Yeah, I mean, that's the beauty of the Netherlands is it's uh, cycling's done everywhere and in tiny villages of a couple hundred people and um, and in the big metropolitan areas like Rotterdam and Amsterdam. Um, we didn't talk about it today because it's, this isn't uh, in the context of, of Corona. Um, the, the pressures on, on rural areas to uh, perhaps react because the, the threats of congestion and pollution aren't, aren't as real. But um, perhaps the opportunity there, and, and we're seeing it now here in the Netherlands, is a, a tourism opportunity that if they provide uh, experiences and opportunities for people to come out and uh, experience the countryside, uh, restaurants uh, and, and, and culture and history, um, that they can perhaps convince people to take holidays closer to home uh, or, or attract people from, from around the world to their destination. So there's lots of uh, examples of cycle routes that they've developed here in the Netherlands, themed cycle routes um, for, for recreational uh, usage um, that certainly stimulate the local economy and, and, and help bring people through. Uh, and then cycling for transportation, yeah, there's a, there's a, a huge national cycling network uh, that's completely separate from the road network, uh, and you can travel virtually anywhere uh, with a series of signposts and, and beautiful red flash, uh, flat asphalt uh, to get virtually anywhere in the country, and it is quite, uh, quite a thing. I think from a, from a transportation perspective in these smaller communities, um, there's an opportunity, nece not necessarily to create fully separated infrastructure because it's likely you're working with very small budgets, um, but to look at using more of those traffic calming measures. So um, you want to draw people into your main, main street to spend money, then make that environment uh, easier for walking and cycling. And so these temporary measures, although there are being, we are seeing more and more of them being implemented in big centers with higher populations, it doesn't mean that there aren't opportunities for small, smaller rural areas as well um, to get people to look at choosing cycling. Um, and a lot of that will come from basically trying to find ways to calm the traffic or finding opportunities to create routes that don't interfere with more of the faster moving traffic that goes around these small areas. Okay, thank you. Um, what is your view on two-way protected bike lanes versus one lane one-way bike lanes in each direction in an urban setting? Excellent question. <laughs> One that comes up a lot. <laughs> yeah, we, I, I know there's um, a, uh, a faction of cycling advocacy community that believes that uh, bi-directional or two-way cycle tracks are, uh, well, some people go as far to say they're, they're more dangerous than nothing, and, and we couldn't agree, disagree more. Uh, we see them all over Delft here, where we cycle uh, regularly. Uh, but there's with two conditions: they're context-specific, so they have to. They're generally along a busier road, where putting one-way cycle tracks on either side of the street doesn't make sense because people aren't going to cross that distance if they want to go the other direction. Um, and the intersections is key. So getting, um, making that cycle track continuous, continuing the color, uh, the uh, raised uh, nature of the cycle track through the intersection across the cross street and uh, not dropping down to the car level but this seamless this uh, con continuation that occurs so that the driver knows that it's trespassing on bike territory it's visible it's clear it knows to look in both directions um, you have to get those intersections right and in that case um, the bi-directional cycle tracks here are statistically just as safe as the one-way ones um, but there are a lot of details you have to get correct and, and it has to be context specific. Mm -hmm. I think if, um, I mean, this is a personal opinion, please take it as that, but I think if uh, you don't have cycle tracks and you're looking at implementing, um, you have the option of implementing single direction, unidirectional or bidirectional, and you have the opportunity to make them unidirectional, then do, again, within context specific. Um, and even those unidirectional need attention at the intersections. Um, but to paint them, paint all bi-directional as um, no better than having nothing is a non-starter. It's a false equivalent. <laughs> okay, thank you. 
There's a question from one of our planning colleagues in Maryland, Andrew Bessold, who says, uh, as a bike expert myself, I still contend that the Dutch bikeway designs work simply because the country is flat and design speeds can be kept low, like below 19 kilometers per hour. Therefore, I contend that these designs won't work in hillier environments where downhill bicycle speeds can easily exceed 50 kilometers per hour. The Dutch seem to acknowledge this as evidenced by the bike infrastructure in the Limburg region of the Netherlands, where the infrastructure looks pretty much like the unbuckled bike lanes in North America. Can you comment on this? Um, well, I think that it would be important to look at the city of Auckland, uh, a city that exists on how many? 50, 50 dormant. dormant volcanoes. And despite that, they are building out infrastructure networks, uh, bike lanes, cycle routes. Um, yes, there is the potential to reach high speeds when you're going downhill. Um, I don't argue that at all, but um, I think the difference that is possibly overlooked in the Netherlands is that uh, there's this um, creation of an environment where you have to acknowledge the people that you're sharing a space with. And so if you're traveling down a hill at 50 kilometers an hour and you see a child there, you should adjust your behavior accordingly because you know that that individual is going to react differently in that space. So it is possible and it is happening in countless cities with hills. Vancouver has hills and they're building out their network. Um, Auckland, as I said, Bern had a cycling network throughout their city. Again, as I said, a mountainous city. Um, so we recognize the challenges of uphill, downhill, and the speeds that can be maintained, but it's about building it in a way where there is the recognition of who you're sharing that pathway with and adjusting your behavior, in my opinion, anyway. Okay. Yeah, that's, um, that's the first one. I haven't heard that before, and I'm just... Process it. Um. I think, yeah, I mean, it's important to remember that there are spaces on cycle networks where speed happens. I mean, it have to be some of the countryside cycle routes are commuter routes here in the Netherlands, and people use speed Cadillacs or speed e bikes with throttle on them, and they do travel quite quickly. But again, from feet or snort, well, yeah. motorized scooters, <laughs> the mopeds. Yeah. Mopeds. Um, and so they're traveling at, at high speeds, but again, then it comes into the idea of space. So giving space, if they're going to share, then there needs to be um, an indication of how they should behave in that space. Otherwise, they need to be kept separate. Yeah. I don't know what, much more to add to that. <laughs> you, you, you may be right. I, yeah, I just, I'm giving it some thought, uh, enough thought, and obviously we're not engineers, so I would have to uh, ask an engineer there their opinion on the topic. Okay, our next question is, uh, there's a lot of resistance to turning parking space and cycle tracks from the business community, even though there is research to support the benefits of bike infrastructure to businesses. <laughs> do Dutch planners also have to navigate this dilemma? And do oh, you have yes. any recommendations for American planners combating this type of nimbyism? Um, consultation with businesses, I mean, uh, when we were working in North America, this seemed to be the key in a lot of ways for getting uh, cycle routes placed in business areas is having them as part of the discussion so they understand what's happening. I think a lot of times that the opposition is in part due to misinformation. Uh, so at least at the very start, have them involved in the conversation because they could likely see a solution that still benefits them. Um, mm -hmm. So there were two strategies that the city of Vancouver used, and one was a, a series of intercept sur surveys. So if they were working on a given street, they would go and survey several hundred, sometimes thousands of customers to see how they arrived at said business, whether it was foot by foot, bike or uh, bus. And in virtually every case, the business owner vastly overestimated uh, the number of people that arrived by car. And uh, when they were presented with that, uh, you know, it did certainly give them pause for um, for thought. Um, the other thing they always did uh, as a kind of compromise uh, was to replace every single parking spot that was lost on the main street uh, with side street parking or uh, free or reduced subsidized multi-story parking uh, in the outlying areas. So the, there was no net loss in parking. It was always uh, every parking spot that was taken was replaced within a five or ten minute walk. 
elsewhere. And that's maybe another compromise um, that you can look at. But um, yeah, it's it's certainly tough. And as Melissa said, it's still it still happens here. Um, but maybe, just maybe, uh, the current situation we find ourselves in, where restaurants are now using parking spaces for terraces, and um, and perhaps understanding that 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 space that was for two or three parked cars is now two or th three dozen customers, um, it might be a bit of a light bulb moment in terms of transforming the way that they look at how their customers arrive and uh, and the the space that's allocated at their curb. Um, will, but time will will tell if that actually has an impact. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, given what you know about how difficult it is in most parts of the U.S. to bring about the kinds of changes that you're describing, have you learned anything about the public process in the Netherlands or elsewhere that would address these challenges? Hmm. Yeah. Well, consultation and cooperation, right? And, yeah. Um, one thing they do really well here is what they call the polder model, um, which is, uh, you know, stakeholders from all different parties coming together and hashing out a solution that works for everybody and, and coming to a consensus uh, without it being seen as one party dictating what the others should and shouldn't be doing. And um, it, it originates from when they were reclaiming the. Uh, uh, the the fields for from uh, the ocean and, and cooperating with each other and, and this kind of bled up into their politics at, at the municipal provincial and uh, and national level um, but one thing they do is yeah bring everybody to the table it's the the um, you know the old age uh, organization these schools the public health groups um, the this uh, disabled groups and and people with uh, sight uh, impairments um, and uh, the more you include uh, hopefully you can uh, come to a consensus as to what everyone is doing because I think right now unfortunately the the consultation just works for the loudest voices in the room and the people with the most time and privilege to come out attend a public hearing and uh, and and rant about uh, a rally against change and we really need to make an effort to go out as Melissa was saying into these communities and give voice to people who don't have the time or the interest to write an email to their city councilor or, or voice in support of change to the street, streetscape because um, they're the ones that all, will ultimately benefit and they're the ones that deserve to be heard just as well. Okay, nothing okay. to add. <laughs> okay. So we'll have just a couple more and then we'll uh, um, comment and question here. I've thought that there might be a better name for bike infrastructure than bikeways or cycle tracks, since this infrastructure is actually for other personal mobility advice, devices, for example, e-scooters. Are there other names for the, this in use around the world? Well, we've, we've heard mobility lanes used. Um, yeah, but not prevalently, I think. No, I, I heard, I think it was Kansas City. Um, started coining their their cycling infrastructure quote unquote um, as mobility lanes and we totally agree uh, far too often the image of bike lanes brings up the fit and the brave and and uh, mobility lanes is much more inclusive and uh, really captures how many different types of people may utilize this, this space once it's carved out from the car space um, yeah I, it's hard because i would say don't get too caught up in the name though, because it's, what's more important is having that space. Um, branding, obviously, as communications and marketing professionals, we think is quite important. Um, but uh, yeah, just, I guess, don't overthink it. <laughs> but if in your, in your discussions, your consultations, you should be using imagery of yeah. people, in, people in wheelchairs and people on kick scooters and people on skateboards and, uh, and various, uh, ages and abilities and ethnicities and economic statuses and to really point out the, the, the diversity of people that will use this space if it's created. Excellent. Okay. Uh, last question for you, uh, kind of a bigger one, but someone is asking, what inspired you to move to the Netherlands? In many countries, it seems that the political will plays a huge role in increasing bike access and safety. How did the Netherlands accomplish that in the 70s, as you mentioned? Um, well, first, what inspired us to move here? Um, well, it, 
it's funny when we said we were moving here so many people were like oh it's the bikes it's the bikes we were known as the bike advocates and people had labeled us this is who we were and i guess we we are um but what it was for us is the experience our children had here uh at the time that was 2016 so they were 9 and 11 respectively and it was um pretty i don't know eye opening to see them being able to navigate the streets without feeling that stress that we often felt uh, when we're traveling around with them by bike in North America. Or just walking. Or just walking. Um, <laughs> so that was really what started to inspire it. We saw children our kids' age traveling independently, children of all backgrounds traveling independently um, from the age of nine onwards, and young, young children like we see now, children the age of like two, three sometimes out on little push bikes or even on regular bikes if they've mastered it by that age, being able to use the streets. And that was what really inspired us to try and make the move here is to give our children the opportunity to live in a place that would afford them the respect to be able to have that independence and freedom. Um, and we were working towards that where we were be where we were living. Um, so that's kind of yeah. the, the theme of our next book. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll be sharing the, some of those stories going from a pretty uh, car-focused neighborhood in Vancouver to this uh, beautiful city of Delft where there's, I mean, we can walk for miles without encountering a single car. And it's the quality of life that that brings to us and our children. It's just amazing. The, the sound quality, the, the, uh, the, the impact on our mental health, just going for long walks without the stress. Uh, it's, it's hard to describe until you're here and, and you actually experience it. It's yeah. quite a, a special place. To come to your, the second question yeah. about how it happened here, I mean, it really was a perfect storm of what Melissa described. It was a road safety crisis. It was the OPEC oil crisis. Um, it was people experiencing their cities for six weeks um, without any cars. And um, we tried to draw these parallels between then and, and what's happening now is people can suddenly hear the birds and they can go out and meet their neighbors without cars whizzing down their streets. We have a friend in Manhattan that was out in the street recording bird sounds in the middle of Manhattan. And so, yeah, yeah. like that was essentially what they were experiencing here in the Netherlands. And um, I think there was a, a mention of political will as well. And, and so, yeah, there was this, like Chris said, a perfect storm of there was both the advocates pushing for it, the circumstances and the environment around the crisis, but then also politicians willing to put their neck out. To try something different and that's there was a few cities that did that um so yeah what read, would you add to that <laughs> read building the cycling city the <laughs> blueprint for urban vitality because we uh we get into uh those various stories and it is yeah. it's not something that's necessarily replicable replicable in 2020 but there certainly are some lessons that we can take and try to apply uh to especially to these uh current times that we find ourselves in. Okay. Well, thank you both today. And I'll, on a personal note, I know this in America here, and maybe it's also true there, with the number of people going to bicycles now, there's uh, shortages of new bicycles and also of parts in some places where you can't even, you have a broken element of your bicycle, can't necessarily get it fixed right away, unless you can fix it yourself. <laughs> so, so any closing thoughts beyond what we've talked about? Um, no, I guess it's just, um, I think what, it's funny, Chris mentioned how we're talking about a lot of the themes around hearing and mental health in the in the upcoming book, but I think one of the things that we realized very early on as we're writing it is what we wanted to do was really, what we want to do with the book is really evoke the feelings that we have living here. And I think there's so many people everywhere in the world that are already experiencing a lot of these things. And so don't take those for granted. Um, you know, if you have the ability to create that change in your city, do. If you want to see that change, fight for it. Um, because that is like that is part of how it had happened here is people fought for it. Um, so yeah, it's you know, we all often joke that people can learn from the lessons that happened here 50 years ago, but you can when you're experiencing it and and take hold of the of the this unfortunate opportunity that's been presented to us. Well done. Well Great. <laughs> well, thank you both for joining us today. Thanks for having us. It's a pleasure. Great.
This will conclude our webinar, Pedaling Through Pandemic, How E-Cycling Can Keep Post-COVID Cities Moving. I'd like to offer a great big thank you to Melissa and to Chris for a great conversation today, for all of those who attended, and to John Coleman, our communications and technology guru who helps to make all of this happen. The complete recording of today's webinar will be posted on smartgrowth.org. Also, for those of you have, who have requested one, all attendees will receive an email that will contain a link to a personal, personalized certificate of participation. Please look for this follow-up email. When you exit from today's webinar, you'll be asked to participate in a short evaluation. Please take a few moments to provide feedback so that we can continue to improve the webinar experience for you. Keep an eye out on smartgrowth.org and your email inbox for details on other future, future webinars, including one on Tuesday, Farms Under Threat, The State of the States, with Julia Friedgood, Mitch Hunter, and Jennifer Dempsey of the American Farmland Trust. Visit smartgrowth.org and watch for these blasts for more information. Have a great day.